Hey everyone, welcome back to Epic Tomorrows. I'm now interviewing Shi Tao. I'm in, we're in Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. Shi Tao is the coordinator of the youth wing of Extinction Rebellion in Montreal. In, well, for the whole of Quebec, actually. So, yeah, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. Um, perhaps you could start by telling us um, when you first got involved with XR and why did you think it was the group for you? I got involved in Extinction Rebellion at the end of 2019, so around August 2019. Uh, it was my best friend from high school who brought me to a meeting because she has been involved since the group's creation in May 2019. And in August, there was an action, there was a public action where um, we occupied the EE Center for about 45 minutes to an hour and we lied down on the ground to symbolize the catastrophe of the environmental crisis and I thought that that was a really effective way of raising consciousness, um, of raising awareness and getting people to care about the climate crisis. So after that action, I told my friend that I was interested and right. then she brought me to the meeting and I became involved from then, from that moment. Great, great. So, so are, you in, are you inspired by the direct action focus of Extinction Rebellion and, and do, I mean, do you think XR, XR Quebec is more action focused than perhaps other climate groups in, in Quebec? We have done a couple of very direct actions. For example, we have occupied streets. We have, you know, occupied um, ministers' offices. So okay. I think that for sure is a direct way to immediately get their attention and yeah. for them to start caring about it immediately because we are like in their office. For example, in February of 2020, there was I don't know if you heard about the tech mining project. No. So it was a mining project in I think it was in Alberta, and it was going to trespass on indigenous land and backslide all of Canada's previous efforts to combat climate change because of the massive amount of CO2 it was going to emit. So there is a group called Indi Indigenous Climate Action in Canada who made a call to action and XR responded and along with other groups we organized um, an, an action to occupy the, the office of a minister in Montreal. His name is Stephen Dibault. He is the Minister of Canadian Heritage and, a, and an ex-climate activist. He was with Greenpeace before. So we occupied um, his office for maybe two to three hours and on the next, and on the next Monday we did get a meeting from, with him and we talked about the importance of rejecting the mining project and at the end uh, tag was withdrawn by the by the company due to public pressure. So for sure, that was a really effective campaign, and it really goes to show how solidarity with Indigenous people and other types of social struggles can really come along with. Great, that's a really great story that, that, that you had some success in being part of the movement that stopped yes. that. Um, so, so how long was it after you first joined? Extinction Rebellion in Quebec, how long was it before you became the coordinator of the youth wing? I think it was maybe six months, a couple of months, just because, um, yeah, like I was really getting involved and I think that I, I have a lot of organizational capacities that make me good with, for example, communicating with other groups, with the adults, with the adults, with the wing of the adults, just to get resources. And yes, so um, I think this is why, um, yeah, people thought that I would make a good organizer. Great, great. So, so somebody else put your name forward first of all, or? Um, yes, yeah, we, we had a vote. We actually have like several active coordinators, but they are not active anymore just because of the pandemic and because of the pressure of online school and other things in their lives. Yeah, we kind of like backslid um, the effort during the pandemic, but we're hoping that this summer we can again um, encourage people to go to protests, even if we're not necessarily organizing them anymore, we can still encourage people, you know, to go to protests in solidarity with other social struggles. Great, great. Okay, so you've talked about, you've talked, you've mentioned the pandemic a few times. Um, so since the, since the since COVID, what, what has changed? I mean, obviously, Extinction Rebellion around the world hasn't been on the streets so much, but has it 
kind of changed the ways that you work in, in, in XR Youth Quebec in other ways? Like, have you learned new ways of connecting online or being connected with other groups online, things like that? Mm -hmm. I think since the COVID, it's been really difficult to um, motivate everyone again, not just um, our group, but also the other groups in the general public. Because here in Quebec, we had a student coalition that was preparing to go for a strike, a general strike in Quebec. I call them to Monero. At the end of March, and actually at my school, I was on the committee of um, climate justice, and we were having a petition signed to call a general assembly to vote the strike. So actually, we were already going to hand the petition in when um, we when we when we began lockdown. So like a lot of people have worked really hard for years just for this strike, and I think for sure they were really disappointed. And after that, because of COVID, because of the fear, um, because of stress, because of online school, I think motivation kind of kind of uh, slurred, started to decrease. So um, we try to maintain our general morale and also public awareness by organizing like small online actions. So for example, during COVID, there were several protests in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people who are in so-called British Columbia and their territory was being occupied by the RCMP to build the coastal gasoline pipe. A coastal gasoline pipeline. Yeah. So they organized several campaigns of information. We would like call ministers and write emails and you know hold online webinars just to raise awareness about yeah. that general yeah about their general plight because I think it, especially for indigenous and other um, racialized organizers during COVID, it's even more difficult to get people to care because I think when we're all at home, some people don't see the effects of real oppression on these people, so therefore they do not pay attention. So I think indigenous organizers have really, um, you know, like they're very admirable, and I think we should all strive to be in solidarity with them. Yeah, so. Is that the, the pipelines going across Canada? I, I think you might be referring to. Is that is that, is that a pipeline that comes down, goes right up to Alaska? Is that, is that not that one? No, I don't no, think no. it was that one. I think um, the, the one that goes up to Alaska is actually the Keystone. Oh, that's Keystone. Yeah, yeah I think that's yeah, probably yeah. Because I know that that one like, does go up. Yeah, but in any case, do, do you think that the. the the, the, the fights of the indigenous people against these uh, destructive pipeline projects, is that one of the main causes for XR youth in, in Quebec and in Canada is is interested in supporting you? Or, or is that one of many is that one of many things you're supporting? I think as um, climate organizers we should strive to be in solidarity with all social struggles because I know that there has been a lot of criticism against XR um, mainly in the UK just because of, you know sometimes their colonial tendencies or they're very white singers or even pro police which um, we strongly disagree with because we think that in the fight against climate change, we have to be in solidarity with all social struggles. For example, um, unions, indigenous people, um, undocumented people, black people, of course, uh, black people, immigrants, refugees, etc. Because they are the, we see these people, their oppression is actually the product of climate change and systemic denial. Because, for example, if we see that um, police tend to be way more brutal with black and indigenous organizers. Well, these are the people who are bearing the brunt of climate change. For example, um, indigenous people, you know, living directly on their land, they are the ones who are first impacted by, for example, oil leaks of the pipelines. The pipelines are always crossing their land, but never, you know, the operated white um, farm towns. So we really see how climate change impacts them directly and their oppression is also a byproduct of colonialism that focuses on exploitation instead of regeneration and rehabilitation. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the fact that colonialism is is part of the, uh, the, the machine, the system that is, that is, that is a big part of the problem, um, which, I, which I would, I guess, personally characterise as um, neoliberal capitalism, I guess I would, I would characterise the kind of dominant paradigm is, 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 is capitalism driving it. So do you have in 
in ex-architect? Do you have, or at least in the youth wing, do you have a strong anti-capitalist element, do you think? Or, yes. Yeah. Uh, we voted positions um, against all systems of oppression, so that includes anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, anti-army, anti-police, and yeah. anti-LGBTQ discrimination, and pro-feminism. So I think these are all important struggles that converge to the liberation of people and the climate. Right, right, right. Um, so that's really interesting because when XR was started in the UK, obviously I'm from the UK, there was in the early months, and there still is amongst a lot of people in, in XR UK, there's still a lot of talk about if we focus too much on social justice, we will alienate the conservative, obviously not far right, but the sort of middle ground conservative or slightly to the right maybe conservative people who we need in order to build a broad social movement. But then other people are saying, no, you can't sacrifice social justice in any in any way at all, like, in, including racial justice and so on. You can't sacrifice that to any degree just for the sake of attracting a wider, a bigger movement. Have you, have you got any more thoughts to say to that? Yes, um, we actually had multiple conversations about this in the group when I first joined, just because intersectionality was a really, um, for example, new concept, was a really new and maybe strange concept to a lot of people. So, like, yes, in our group we had a lot of um, like white climate activists who quit after we voted really? these positions because they were not in agreement of you know, um, racial justice or feminism or pro LGBTQ plus. But what, what, like the remaining of XR, we really think that social justice is tied to climate justice. So without one, there cannot be the other. And um, you know, according to XR UK's philosophy, we only need 3.5 percent of the population to have a successful. Um, uprising. So we, I think we really need to ask ourselves, who do we want these 3.5% to be? Do we want to be in solidarity with immigrants and refugees and, you know, um, people who are in poverty? Or do we really, or do we want to attract, like, the right wing or people who are bigoted but who, you know, want the climate to be protected? I think another um, really big problem on, uh, now is eco-fascism. And I think that that's an ideology that, if we're not careful, can really be um, maybe, um, you know, some people, if they're not careful in how they're organizing and voicing their messages, I think it can really send the wrong message to people. For example, we saw the shooter in El Paso, I think it was in 2018, in the U.S., and the shooter in Christchurch in New Zealand. They all left behind a manifesto that says that, you know, they think that brown people and black people are killing the are killing the earth and are destroying the climate and that is why they went on a shooting spree. So we can so this is a hype. So eco fascism is a hateful ideology that literally kills people. So I think it's really important that we should be aware of it and that we should not um, derive from our goal of liberation. Oh, it's, it's, it's here. Right, yeah, no I agree with you totally. I think, I think it's fantastic. Um, so, oh, I've got lots of questions swimming around in my head, or, or the beginning, the beginning, please take your time. Beginnings of questions, yeah. Um, well, one thing is that you mentioned the importance of being pro-feminist. Um, I, I, I'm definitely aware since the past few years of, of the extent of patriarchy in, in global society, and, and I'm and, uh, including within myself and the way I've been conditioned as a man and so on. So, how do you have any specific ways of working within within XR Quebec Youth, which to try and guard against patriarchal uh, attitudes and so on? I think we haven't really seen this problem in XR Youth, but there were problems in XR Adults and also in the student coalition where I was, because in XR Youth we're mainly kids, like from like 14 to 18, so I don't think like there are you know these types of um, you know, um, explicit problems yet, but I think in XR Adult and in this week coalition where I was working, there were definitely, you know, um, a few predators who were out there um, because they 
for example, because they were abusive or predatory towards, you know, members, our fellow members, yeah. our fellow climate activists. And I think that um, in order to abolish these kinds of structures of power that allowed these situations to happen in the first place, I think it's really important that we maintain decentralization. Um, just because I think a lot of times, you know, the people who committed these, um, I guess, assaults are are people who have a high standing among the group, who are considered, you know, who are revered, who are considered, you know, great climate activists, you know, great people, like people, they are being admired and revered and worshipped and idolized. And I think that especially can be extremely da dangerous because it allows unequal dynamics of power to take root. And then they can use this power to, for example, exploit um, younger, more vulnerable people. So I think it's really important that we, yeah, that we distribute power and resources equally in order for everyone to have an equal standing in the group just to prevent abuses of power. And I also think that, um, yeah, exactly. For example, our group, we have we passed a policy that we will not, you know, tolerate any type of sexual assault in our group or any type of, you know, drug through comments towards, you know, women and other minorities. So I think that's also really important. We have to protect, you know, minorities so that they can feel safe within our group. Yeah. And the more we feel safe, the more we feel comfortable to stand up for ourselves when things, um, you know, when things are wrong. So I think that these all contribute to establishing, yeah, like equal dynamics and abolishing patriarchy. Great, great, fantastic. Um, I mean, it's great. It's great to see you leading by example. That you're, that you're the acting coordinator of XR Youth Quebec. So, have you personally experienced any sort of derogatory or, or uh, abusive comments from? Uh, no, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. Maybe that's not necessary. But um, what, what else can I say about that? Okay, let me say something more positive. Okay. Yeah. How, how do you do? As well as as well as sort of getting rid of patriarchy and patriarchal tendencies and guarding against those, do you go a bit further and actively promote, a actively promote female leadership? In yes. group? Yeah. I think one thing that we noticed, we were having a meeting with the adults just to talk about how we can abolish oppression within our group, and actually it was a male friend of mine who noticed that men are often delegated um, men often volunteer to be, you know, spokespeople or to be interviewed at events, but it's mostly, you know, women and non-men who are doing most of the organizing, the coordinating. So what we decided is to, you know, um, we have to, uh, you know, the organizers who are organizing, we're trying to delegate um, a few tasks just so that everyone can, you know, have some experience and we do not get burnt out. And also we are trying, yeah, now when we do events, we are prioritizing women, non-binary people, um, and non-white people as spokespeople, just so that they, they can also have a chance to be recognized right. as, you know, great, great climate activists. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, you, a moment ago, you made the link between uh, patriarchy and centralization and how decentralizing is a, is a good kind of it, it goes along with getting rid of patriarchy decentralizing democratizing the movement isn't it so i know in the uk we've had real problems with uh or challenge, let's say yeah. it's been a real challenge to decentralize and and most people fully admit that um, but but it's still something that's being worked on and i hope to see it go further but i also hope that other countries who have slightly younger XR groups, not in age, but in when they were found, when they were started, I hope that other countries might develop in different ways and, and not encounter the same problems of decentralisation that the UK is is encountering. Um, but I don't know that much about what's happening in other countries. Do you think in XR Canada as a whole, and also in XR Quebec as a whole? Um, and also, thirdly, in XR Youth Quebec, do you think centralisation is still something that needs a lot of work to decentralise on different levels? Um, we, we actually had a training about that a couple of uh, months ago, 
and there were three types of diagrams, and I forgot their names. The first one is complete centralization, the second one is completely complete decentralization, and the third one was kind of half-half, where we had you know one core group that separates into different committees, and these committees do outreach. So I think this is the st structure that we kind of naturally adopted, because before, when we're doing really big actions, we would have to split the tasks among us, so we kind of did um, like subcommittees. We have the arts committee, the media committee, um, I think we had a, we have a care committee just to like take care of people and ensure their general well-being. We have a an intersectional committee. So I think um, when we, for example, when we need something to be done, we will go. Uh, we will tell people in the general chat, for example, to refer to these groups and people who are part of these groups so they can organize them themselves what they want to do. For example, if you need posters, then we our people can decide what kind of posters they want to do or you know what color schools. So I think. Um, for us, well, for us, of course, we're not as many people as there are in the UK. Like yeah. in the UK, it's really a large movement. Us, we're not a lot. We're about like maybe like forty to fifty in the group chat. So I think that that's the youth. That's just XYU. yes. Yeah, yeah. We're about like forty to fifty in the group chat, maybe. So I think that really helps, um, you know, people with splitting time. The task yeah, and you know they can five. organize amongst themselves so I think it for us it seems to be an equitable way of balancing things yeah great I mean I can see the need for um, a balance between leadership and kind of innovation and decentralization on the other hand um, but I think one of the challenges in the UK has been in my mind anyway this is my personal critique I guess is that according to the Kind of system of holacracy, where where you can just kind of start a new group as long as it's in line with principles and values, and as long as you find a few other people who agree with you, it seems like the way the way it the way it's applied anyway is that anyone can start a new group whenever they want under the name of XR, which is fine, and I really support that on one level, and think it's great that people can just innovate and create a new kind of group, but at the same time. If the people that have set up that new group are already in lots of other groups, then where's the accountability in terms of have, do they have too much power? Because in the UK, what you what you get sometimes it seems to me somebody may correct me after watching this is that um, you have certain people in, in all of these circles, these different groups in London, and then one of the, a person in one of these groups has an idea for a new group, which is great. And then they form this new group, but the problem is the people who go into the new group are also like amongst people they know in London, and 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 this influences the whole organism in the whole country. So like, if some people decide to do like a wrong action or do something that yeah, like not, hurts people, yeah, not not not, not, not even that. Well, that could happen, yeah. But even on a more subtle level, if if yeah. somebody creates a group which is focused around working more with businesses or. or so something which might be seen as, um, e even if it's something quite progressive. So, for instance, recently a group was set up in the UK to look at to look at reviewing and evolving XR's demands, the three central demands. So, I just got an email newsletter saying, "Oh, this new group's been set up to look at um, maybe changing the demand." For XR. And I thought, "Oh, well, that's a good idea," but. They gave a very short consultation process, and you know, if you couldn't meet, make the meetings, then suddenly you couldn't be consulted about this. And then I can see that a couple of months down the line, we're all going to get another email saying, "Oh, the demands have been changed because this new group has." So, so you get these new groups forming, which have very good intentions, and I'm sure the people in them are really, you know, good people and good activists. But it's just that with the with the lack of decentralization I wonder whether uh, there can be problems there and I just wondered whether you'd experienced anything similar like that where it's a well moon a well-meaning group of people have gone off and done something by themselves and they haven't realized that they haven't consulted properly other people. Us, like in the youth group, too small. For that yeah, because which we're is good. too small. And but also, there's, we, there's do not, <laughs> we do not uh, have a lot of resources. For example, we don't have the money, we don't yeah. have any supplies. So, whenever, you know, for example, we do art, like we have to bring our own supplies. Or if we want money, we have to ask, you know, the adults for a cut of the budget. Um, yeah, so I think it's. Um, it, we haven't really experienced these problems yet, but what we have experienced is people not agreeing with actions that we're planning and threatened to do something um, on their own that no one agreed in, 
that no one agrees with and reclaim it as an extra action. So we did have a lot of discussions on this. But I think fortunately at the end, like we decided to vote, you know, by consensus and the action did not pass. So the person, you know, like kindly um, kind of like put this idea aside. So um, yeah, I didn't really have it, but I think definitely there were people who were threatening to do things that could harm other people yeah. and reclaim it as an extra action. Okay, so talking about autonomy of actions, so how does it work in, in XR Youth Quebec or, or maybe in XR Quebec more widely? If you have autonomous affinity groups, um, can they pretty much to decide to do any action and just do it if it's in line with principles and values or does, does it have to be passed by a central actions committee? Or? Well, I don't think so, like not really. For example, if we're organizing protests, um, we would have to and I'm just going to say, for example, if someone contacts me, I'm going to say in the chat, do you want to do this action? I kind of explain the action and we vote yes or no. Uh, if yes, I do the action. Uh, no one has, like, we haven't encountered an action where people said no. So, like, <laughs> we've always, you know, kind of done the actions. Or if it's something smaller, for example, um, if it's, um, if it's, uh, if it's, um, a group for, Immigration justice, they have a protest, they will ask us to go, you know, and pass the leaflets around town or, you know, um, like poster around town. Like these, we will just say, oh, we're, we're going poster ring with them because we collaborate regularly with them. So we're just going to say, oh, like these per this person contacted me and see and wanted to see if I can go postering, like who wants to be there and people will volunteer themselves. So I think it, we have a really good harmony within the group and I'm obviously very grateful for that. And yeah, like I'm really happy that people, uh, yeah, like are proposing actions or are willing to be in solidarity. Great, great. Okay, so um, would you say that would you say that XR Quebec youth, the youth wing, is more radical than the adult wing? And um, well, yeah, just that really. And, and the reason I ask that is sometimes I get frustrated with some of the discussions that go on amongst Extinction Rebellion adults in the UK and and I noticed some of the sort of youth discussions because they put them on YouTube and stuff sometimes and part of me thinks I can't wait for XR youth to take over because like they have more sometimes they just seem more on the ball and more progressive um, have you got anything to say about that? I think um, I don't know if Elsa has talked to you about it, but I think XR Youth is definitely more radical than the adults. Well, when they were so active, I think, because now they reorganized a affiliation groups, and we haven't really collaborated with them because of the pandemic, so I can't really talk about now, but I think back then, like pre pandemic, we were definitely more radical than them. Yeah. We voted a lot of you know, anti capitalist, anti imperialist yeah. um, positions that they did not want to vote on. Or I think, you know, like the fourth principle, we had to like talk to them <laughs> for them to vote on the fourth principle of when back in reparations to BIPOC people. And I think one of the major um, maybe conflicts that we may have had, you know, for, well, me anyway, <laughs> is that during the, uh, like that at the beginning of the pandemic, there were, you know, all these hate crimes against Asian people and we asked them to vote a position to condemn the hate crimes and they would not. And I think, anyway, like personally, you know, as an Asian person who has been hate crime in Montreal, or and as a person who you know was delegated to communicate with them, I think that really, really frustrated me because we sent up positions um, in the Google Docs, and I was scrolling down, and I was seeing at all these, and I was looking at all these things that we were writing, and I was like, oh my god, like, I cannot believe that these people are are in XR. So I think yes, like definitely disappointment. Um, anger uh, a bit of like uh, yeah. like a bit of maybe discuss like not at them specifically yeah. but at this phenomenon at this recurring phenomenon but i think fortunately now they have organized themselves into new affinity groups that are much more radical and okay. much more inclusive and intersectional right right do, do you feel do you feel um as 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 the as the youth group do you feel more do you feel empowered to really go, I mean you've already spoken to this in a way, you've already suggested that you are able to stand up for yourselves against the adults when you need to and so on, which is great to a degree, 
but I know you, meant, you also mentioned that you have to apply to them for funding at the moment. Have you thought about becoming more independent and setting up your own like crowdfunders and things and actually being even more independent from the, from the adult group? Yes, we have thought about that um, during the pandemic, but the thing is we have to set up a bank account yeah. and um, we consulted the accountant with the adults and she said that it would be kind of really complicated because like first of all, like to who would the money go? Like I don't want to be in charge of the money. Like, um, like I'm way too scared of, you know, having like money in the bank account. So like who would it go to? So I think these are all logistics that we can explore like after the pandemic yeah. when we become more independent and you know, we have when we have new perspectives yeah. in our adults. Because I think, like, some somebody from the XR adult saying that to you, they might be right, but they might also be saying that because they're scared of you becoming more independent. Oh, I don't think. No, no, oh, no okay. like we're always asking them for like stuff. I don't think. Oh, okay. Like they want us. Okay. They're probably like, yeah, like get your own oh, money, okay. do your own thing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, that was a wrong guess for me then. <laughs> um, fair enough. Um, okay, so you, yeah, you've talked a lot about the importance of uh, solidarity with other groups, social justice, racial justice. Um, are there any particular groups, apart from um, indigenous groups fighting against the pipelines in Canada, are there any other particular groups that you've made links with? For instance, have you made links with any Black Lives Matter activists? Um, um, and you talk, you, you mentioned unions. Have you made any links with unions? Um, not particularly. We mainly heard about you know the struggle of unions because most of us are studying and not in a full-time job. Yeah. So we mostly heard about the struggles of the unions um, through Solidarity <laughs> Sans Frontières um, or Solidarity oh, Across Borders in yeah. English, which is an organization for undocumented people in Montreal. They are in contact with, for example, the unions. Um, of people who are working in um, in like essential jobs during the pandemic, who are really you know being mistreated, exploited, and underpaid by their employers. So, for example, um, Dollarama. I know that there were workers in Dollarama who voted the strike. So we heard about this action through solidarity of these workers. Otherwise, um, other organizations. There is a one called the Bukul Adventi. The what? Sorry. The Bukul which is um, for undocumented, which is for undocumented essential workers during the, the pandemic. Um, you know, for them to get their permanent status. I think um, these these are mainly people from Haiti. Uh, yeah, migrant workers from Haiti who are fighting to be um, regularized as a Canadian permanent resident. There is also defund the police, defund the SPDF which um, yeah, which organizes protests, so for example, defund the police and to protect racialized communities with our own resources. So these are the organizations that we work with. There is also the, the Student Coalition for Climate and Social Justice, which is the student coalition that I was part of. But they're also like a white majority, so they're not, um, yeah, so they're also in solidarity with all of these groups. Okay, that's fascinating. And when I watch this back, I'll be noting it all down and then contacting you to get links and things. Yes, and so on. Um, they are really incredible. They have really nice. For example, Solidarity of the Sporters, last week they walked to Ottawa, from, they walked from Tiochaki here to Ottawa to demand um, status for all. So I think that's really, definitely really inspiring actions. Fantastic. So, can you tell me what links you might have with, uh, do you have very strong links with other youth extinction rebellion groups around the world? We have, I have to say, not necessarily. Okay. We have talked to, just because we, we're all in a chat together, like all the youth um, delegates. Just because it's we're so many, so it's a bit hard to get to <laughs> one of them. But we are in touch with Exeter Youth Ontario. That's good. And uh, last year we were looking into establishing an Exeter Youth Canada, like uh, yeah, a Canada committee. But I think that was I think we decided to put this project aside after we decided to you know re-examine um, the principles of XR and how and the intersectionality of it and how we can be more inclusive and how we can direct our funding better into 
groups who needed more than us. So I think we kind of put this project on hold, but definitely, um, yeah, we have, we'll have to re-examine it soon. Yeah, that that sounds really great. That, that, um, on the one hand, you're open to making connections with the other youth groups, but on the other hand, you're also very careful about it and being very mindful about it. And yeah, because. It's not necessarily a good thing to make lots of links all over the world if, 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 if you haven't worked out where you stand first of all. Exactly. And so yeah, that's that that helps me actually. It helps me because sometimes I'm like I need to connect with as many people as possible. But it's I need to make sure that that's fine as long as I know where I stand first of all. But yeah, thank you for that. That's good. Um, so now that now that the pandemic restrictions are easing off a bit. Have you got any kind of more street-based protests or actions planned as the youth group? Um, I think now we're really trying to focus on the logistic aspect of it because with the student coalition, we're also looking into how we can, you know, better reach um, minority, you know, groups from, you know, minority backgrounds and how we can better collaborate with them and, you know, directly work with them. So I think we're we're kind of that. But also, I know that there are many protests planned ahead by people who are in XR, who were in XR adults. So, for example, I know that um, the NHL drafted, like, I'm not too familiar with uh, the story, but the NFL drafted um, a hockey player who I think committed sexual assault. So I think there is um, there is um, an organizer who used to be in XR adults who organize, um, who is organizing a protest against um, his drafting on the 28th of August, so this we will you know, definitely look to attend. And there was also another protest for, I think, um, in solidarity with trans people next week, so we will definitely try to rally our members to attend. Okay, great. Fantastic. That sounds really positive. Um, so, apart from sort of short-term, medium-term actions, do you have the same vision as XR UK originally had, well still has, of alongside XR adults of, I mean how realistic is it, do you think that you could eventually be part of a movement where you are mobilising 3.5% and that amount of people are actually out on the streets and forcing the government to take action, do you think that's still a realistic objective considering how bad things are getting with the climate and, um, or are you or are you I mean maybe I'm just asking not for XRU Vax view but your personal view do you think how, how do you see activism I mean it's a big question so don't, don't worry but like over the next couple of years how do I think what do you think should happen or what's the most important thing and how do you think we can get lots of people onto the streets? I think um, personally, I discussed it with my friends from the coalition uh, I think a few weeks ago and actually I think that in Quebec we're actually gaining momentum because yeah. of all the you know, protests during the pandemic also with a right-wing government um, I think people have seen all the injustices and they're getting extremely angry so I think we are trying to rebuild the momentum that we lost before the, uh, when the pandemic first started and we're definitely trying to yeah, build it up and use it at the appropriate moment so that we can mobilize everyone else as for the future of inclusive development in Quebec, like we're not sure what's going to happen yet. Maybe XR Quebec will go on. Maybe XR Quebec will eventually be dissolved so that everyone can go into groups where they are needed the most. Um, if there is like a big movement, so I think we sh we're just going to take it naturally and see where it goes. And if XR eventually dissolves, you know, I'll always be happy and proud that I was, you know, part of a movement. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, well, I think that's a really good place to end, a um, really positive place to end. Okay. So, Shitao, thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, no problem.